Today's seminar, Building a Responsive Layout. This is the fourth and final of the four-part series, the Aquint Vitamin T Summer of Learning. Thank you again, Aquint and Vitamin T, for sponsoring this free series, putting everybody together to learn more about new HTML technologies. Really happy to be here. Today, we're going to talk about responsive design and how to implement it into your own website. We're going to talk about what it is and what it isn't. It's going to be a nice, good overview. My name is Jim. I live in Washington, D.C., and I'm a web developer and teacher. Today's big ideas. Big idea number one. Responsive design means page layouts that change based on the screen size, based on the size of the browser. That's what responsive design is. That's really all it is. But we're going to talk about some of the other things that some people think it is, and that's cool. Big idea number two. When you're using responsive design, first step is to use fluid grids to lay out your pages. A grid is like a typographical grid, like in print design, but instead of being a static grid that's laid out in inches or points or pixels, and, and on the web it would be pixels, we use fluid grids that flex back and forth to the size of the monitor. I'm going to show you how. Big idea number three. Sometimes those fluid grids don't work. When the browser is too small or too big, Fluid grids break, the fluid layouts break, and we use media queries, which is a CSS extension. It's built into CSS. All modern browsers use it and understand it. Old browsers don't, but that's okay. Uh, and we use that module, that extension to CSS, when fluid layouts break. I'm going to explain more about this and show you examples of how, that, how to use that. Big idea number four. This is really helpful, hopefully, for you folks that are new to it. Responsive design is a lot of work. It is not an easy thing to accomplish. Uh, I'm going to talk through some of the pitfalls of responsive design, ways to make life easier for yourself, and ways to talk to your bosses and the folks around you about responsive design. Okay? Let's get started. Big idea number one. Responsive design means page layout based on screen size. Okay, let me show you what I mean here by going to a layout that's not responsive. Let me go with a traditional layout or a fixed layout. Let's take this example here, the New York Times homepage. This is the New York Times homepage, a screenshot from a couple days ago, uh, and this is viewed on a 19 inch desktop screen. Now, this page is coded in such a way that the width of the body here, of the main part of the page, is 970 pixels wide. That's what it's locked into. Completely fine. No beef with that. It's absolutely a completely standard way to lay out web pages. But here's what that web page looks like on a much larger desktop that has a bigger screen resolution. There's another screenshot. You see it's still 970 pixels wide, but you got all this space on the left and the right. There's no problem with it technically. It's just not the most attractive thing in the world, but we're okay still. Let's look at it on a tablet, which is much smaller than a 19 or 21 inch, inch desktop. The tablet shrinks down the size of the page. This is actually a little bit smaller than it would appear on the laptop or the desktop and puts it right up to the edges here. So we don't have some edges, but it shrinks it down. Okay, no sweat. Let's look at it on a phone. Here's a screenshot from a phone. Again, the page, the whole 970 pixels, is shrunk down to this phone, which is about two and a half inches uh, across. So this is not readable, completely not readable at all, but you see the entire web page as it would appear on a desktop. If you want to read the home page of the New York Times, you've got to pinch or scroll or zoom in, and you see something like this. You see a zoomed in version of the desktop experience. Okay, That's been the standard, that's been how everything's built. New York Times is a serious website. They've got a heck of a great design and development team working on their site. That's how they're built, so we know this is a standard way of doing things. Let's look at another example using a responsive layout. The Boston Globe is a website that uses responsive design and it's HTML and it's CSS. This is what the Boston Globe homepage looks like on a 19 inch monitor. It's again it's an actual screenshot from a couple of days ago. You notice here it's got the banner, it's got some navigation, it's got a little sports ticker here um, uh, for when the, the Red Sox won, and it's got three column layout. A, a, a sort of moderately sized column here, a smaller one with a couple of headlines, and uh, another moderately sized with a banner ad on top. See what I'm going there with there? Three columns. Now, let's look at a screenshot on a tablet. Aha, this looks a little different. Instead of shrinking everything down like the New York Times did, they dropped a column. 
Do you see that? This is only has two columns. So desktop, tablet. They just dropped a column. Now, as it turns out, that column is down below. So it didn't disappear from the page entirely. You have to scroll down to get to it. But they changed the layout because the tablet has a smaller screen. Now, let's look at it on the phone. Here's what it looks like on the phone. Completely different. Now it's just one column. Not only is it one column, but check this out. The navigation changed too. The nav you see the navigation here? It says sections, and it says my saved, and a little search magnifying glass. But on the tablet screen, it said sections, today's paper, and my saved, and had a search box. And on the desktop version, it said news, metro, arts, business, sports, opinion, all these. And the search box is up here. So not only did they drop columns, they completely reformatted the navigation bar in these three versions. So that what you see on the version that you're looking at on your phone, your tablet, or your desktop is suited for the size of your screen. The, the banner changed to it, changed sizes, and this guy changed sizes, the, uh, the weather. So they actually changed a whole bunch of stuff here. So if you're smart, you might be thinking to yourself right now, oh, Jim's just talking about a mobile site. You're building a separate site for a mobile device. That's what I'm talking about. Well, no, that's not what I'm talking about. But mobile sites do exist. And let me, let's take a look at one and see what the difference is. Let's take a look at the Washington Post. I'm, I'm in the newspapers right now. Uh, this is the Washington Post screenshot on a 19-inch monitor. Uh, it's got three columns like the Boston Globe. Uh, it's got the nice banner here and navigation up above and a little bit of white space on either side. Now, this is a fixed layout. Also, if you have to look at it on a big monitor, uh, it's, it's locked into the current size that it is here. No problem at all. But if you look at this on a phone, it looks completely different. The banner is much, much smaller. They've got an ad here stripped across the top, and you've got one column with stories. So desktop version, iPhone version. Okay, this is a mobile site. How do I know this is a mobile site? Because I'm teaching this webinar. No, I know this is a mobile site because I looked at here in the URL and it says mobile.washingtonpost.com instead of www.washingtonpost.com. So they've set up, the good folks of the Washington Post have set up some separate infrastructure that delivers the same news story but in a mobile layout. One downside of this uh, there are some upsides, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later, but one downside of this is if I'm surfing these stories on my phone, and I use the little function to send it to a friend, to email it to a friend, what it emails them is mobile.washingtonpost.com slash whatever the story is. So that means if my friend that I emailed a story to looks at it on their desktop, they see the mobile version, and they see it on their desktop. So if you go to mobile.washingtonpost.com on your desktop, of which this is a screenshot, you get a completely different version of the Washington Post homepage. Here's they look at, and here's they side by side. This is the desktop version, and this is the mobile version. But you can look at both in a desktop, and you can send links to somebody else that's the wrong version. You might send them the desktop version if they're on a phone, or you might send them the mobile version if they're on a desktop. And for that, we are very unimpressed. That is not a slick way to do things, but all props to the folks of the Washington Post. They're hard workers and they do a really good job. Responsive design uses CSS to change the page layout based on screen size. That's what the Boston Globe does and what the Washington Post does not. Now, let me give you a quick buzzword alert. Responsive design has come to mean some other things as well. At its core, it's HTML and it's CSS tricks. But it's come to mean a number of things involving the best experience given to each user. Those things include page layout, which is what we're talking about, that includes load time, it cl uh, things like delivering the smallest number of assets and the smallest images, image delivery, to mobile devices, which have bad networks. You know, if you're downloading something on 3G, you want to get the smallest version of that thing so it comes up fast. If you're downloading it at home on your cable modem, it doesn't matter as much. It can come up a lot fast. It can uh, be a lot bigger, and it will still come up quickly for you. It also incorporates uh, uh, this term. Also also incorporates content strategy, which is writing things specifically for different devices, um, maybe making shorter copy if you're on a smaller screen that gets the same stuff across. Uh, there are other ways in which content strategy can come
come into being. So all this stuff can be called responsive design. But for the purposes of this webinar, we're not talking about that. We are only talking about page layout based on screen size. That brings me to big idea number two. This is how you actually uh, do responsive design. Step one is to use fluid grids to lay out pages. Let me walk you through how a fluid grid works. Here's a web page that I've made up for uh, uh, in, in honor of uh, Usain Bolt um, uh, and his recent wins. Uh, this also is part of the homework assignment that you're going to get, so pay attention. This web page here, fairly standard thing. I've got a header here uh, with a little subhead underneath, and I've got two columns of content, an article and a sidebar. All this stuff is from Wikipedia. I've set the body here, the entire body, actually the body tag, to be a static width of 970 pixels. Very straightforward. I have two columns here. I measured those two columns in my mock-up and determined that they were 580 pixels for the left column and 340 for the, for the right column. So, coding that in my CSS, easy to do. Make the, I keep the width 970, I make the article, the article tag, hey, some HTML5 goodness here. This is the article tag, this column. I make it 580. I make the aside, the sidebar, more HTML5 goodness, the width of 340. I add a margin right of 50 pixels to this guy, and that makes the uh, gutter here in between the two columns. Now, there's other CSS happening, obviously, here. I've got a float happening, a couple of floats. Um, I've got typography CSS happening. I've got some borders and some colors going on here. I've taken this down to the very uh, bare minimum to try to show you what it is that I'm trying to show you. So this 970 pixel layout, very, very standard, nothing at all wrong with it. It will validate in a whatever you want to validate it in. Um, if I make this browser window that I'm looking at it in smaller, here's what happens. It's bit set for 970, so if I take a desktop browser window, or any browser window, shrink it, make it smaller by grabbing the corner, I'm not going to see all the content. It cuts it off in an awkward way. And for that, we are unimpressed. But CSS lengths, like these widths here, can be set not as pixels. They can be set as percentages. In fact, any CSS length can be set as a percentage. What? What do you mean? If you've never done this before, this is totally cool. Let me show you how. I can change the body here, the body tag, to instead of being a width of 970 pixels, be a width of 100%. And what it means is 100% of its container, or of its parent. In this case, the container of the body is the window itself. The browser window itself is the only thing that's holding the body in. So I'm saying make the body be as wide as the window is, 100% of that width. Now, this text isn't going right up against the edge here because I've installed some margins and padding, um, so that's why it's not there. If I didn't have any margin or padding, the text would bleed right up against the edge of the window here, but that's not what I've done here. I'm just omitting that CSS. Now, the body is 100%. I can set the column widths the same way. Instead of setting column widths of uh, 640 pixels and 320 pixels or whatever those column widths were a few slides ago, I can set them as percentages. This column should be 60% of the entire window, and this column should be 35% of the entire window, or more properly, of the tag that these guys are in, which is the body tag. So this is 60% of the body tag, and this is 35% of the body tag. To code that, same way you just use percentages instead of pixels. So the body width is 100%, the article is 60 with a margin right of 5%, and the aside is a width of 35%. Why did I set the gutter here, the margin right to be 5%? Well, because 60% plus 35% plus 5% is 100%. So I made it add up to 100. If I didn't, you might see some extra um, space here on one side or on the other side or in the middle. I might not be able to predict it. Make it add up to 100. I'm nice and tight, and I understand where everything is. I do all this. I save it. I refresh it in a browser. Boom. It looks exactly the same. It does not look any different until you start resizing the browser window. Aha! Uh -huh. You see here? You see what's going on? I've made the browser window smaller, but instead of cutting off the content, it shrinks it down. These columns are still 60% and 35% of the browser window. It's just that now the browser window is smaller.
Now, print designers will look at this um, and go boo because uh, the, it changes line lengths. Uh, these things might wrap around in a way that you can't predict. Um, and there might be changes in the way that these things look based on how wide the browser window is. Not just print designers. I'm, I'm, I'm teasing print designers a little bit because they're used to being able to look at things and know exactly how they're going to look all the time. It's not the case on the web and not the case when you use responsive or fluid designs. There's going to be some variation. You have to be okay with that. So for us, we say, yay, this looks really nice. However, Let's see what it looks like when we make the browser window even smaller than what we're looking at right here. Here it is, even smaller. Oh yeah, it looks great, doesn't it? Uh, all right, so what do we got here? This guy right here, we got a big section of white space that looks horrendous because this word, lightning with the quotes, won't fit. The image there is cutting off the amount of space that it has. These guys look just absolutely horrendous. And plus, if I was actually looking at it on a screen this size, like, say, a phone, I, would, I wouldn't want to scroll down and read these really short line lengths, then have to scroll all the way back up and read these ridiculously short and useless line lengths. So this fluid layout by itself is not working for us. And this is one of the reasons that fluid layouts, which have been around for many, many years, um, I mean, you could always use percentages in CSS. Even before CSS existed, you could use percentages, and it would do this stuff. But they weren't common in websites for this reason, because you can make things small or big and make it look icky. That's where big idea number three comes in. We use media queries when fluid layouts break. Let me explain what I mean by that. This fluid layout is definitely broken. It's broken because it's too small. What I mean is too small, the browser window is too small, and that's broken the layout. It's made it icky and not good for us to look at. It's not technically broken, but it looks, it looks like garbage. CSS can be used to target, to, you can, I'm sorry, you can target CSS based on the browser's width. CSS can understand what the width of the browser window is and can apply different styles uh, accordingly. Let me explain how that works in code. There's some CSS code you can add to your style sheet. This is CSS we're looking at right here. We start with the at sign, an at media query. What at media says, it's just the word at media. That's all you got to do. Just put it on a line by itself. What it means is, hey, the CSS that you're about to see needs to be targeted to something having to do with the user's device, with however this thing, this piece of content is being viewed. What we're saying here is that only on the screen which means not uh, when you print. Um, there's some other things too, but really it's screen and print. So we're not, we don't care about when a page is printed out. We care when it's on a display. If the screen is a maximum width of 320 pixels, which means it's, uh, it's, it's at its biggest 320, then do the stuff inside these curly braces. Inside the curly braces should go code, CSS code for screens that are 320 pixels or smaller because we said the max width should be 320. Huh. This code can be used for other pixel widths. If we say the max width should be 1024 pixels, then the code in here is CSS for 1024 pixels or smaller. Likewise, as you probably guessed, instead of saying max width, we can say min width. You could say minimum width of 1024. And that, that means the CSS code in here is for monitors that are bigger than 1024 pixels. So, what we can say is, we can take this guy right here, this, uh, our broken layout, and we can say, okay, when the screen or when the browser window is really small, let's say smaller than 320 pixels, which means that the maximum width is 320 pixels, then we want to change this layout. What we want to do is we want to take this column right here, just the article tag, and this column right here, which is the aside tag, and let's get rid of the floats and let's make them go all the way across so the columns will be stacked on top of each other instead of side by side. That's what we're going to do. And here's the code. We do this media query, this at media query, and say, hey, if you're on a screen and the maximum width is 320, which means your screen is 320 or smaller, then the article and a side tag should have a width of 100% and get rid of the floats. This is just regular old CSS, and it's inside these curly braces here at the top and here at the bottom, which means it only applies when this thing is true. 
this thing, this at media query, is understand, understood by all modern browsers up to several versions back. If you've got an ancient browser that does not understand at media queries, all of this is ignored. It doesn't do any of it. It doesn't understand stuff that's inside double curly braces, and so it does none of it. So it actually falls back fairly gracefully, and you can the behavior is expected. You can plan for what's going to happen on your ancient browsers, like the old IEs. When we apply this CSS code, we make the width 100% of both columns and get rid of the floats. Here's the result. This is all we did. That's literally all I did to this page. And then I took another screenshot. That makes this article column wide to fit 100% or the browser window. So it's much. It's got a lot more breathing room here. If I scroll down the page, here is the sidebar column. It's beneath the article column is the sidebar did exactly what I wanted to. Now, if I make the browser window wider again, it boom, magically pops back into place because it takes away the uh, this application. When the maximum width is larger than 320 because I've made the window bigger, I can even drag the window and watch it go boop into place. This stuff goes away. Very cool. Big idea number four. If you're going to actually do this stuff, Responsive design is quite a bit of work. Now, the things that I've just walked you through, Big Idea 2 and 3 with the fluid layouts and the media queries, that is responsive design. That's essentially it, technically speaking. You get those two things down, you have all the tools that you need to build a responsive layout for a small website or a big site. There's no server-side magic going on, at least in, I mean, you can add server-side magic, and sometimes that can be very useful. But um, to, to do a bare minimum responsive design, you've got the tools right now. I've just told them to you. There's nothing else secret or special. But it's a lot of work. Here's why it's a lot of work. A couple of reasons. First is a um, kind of a, a human reason. Um, many of you, if you're designers, developers, especially in companies that are not web-centric companies, um, you will get a finished design, a finished graphic design, maybe even a finished website, and they'll tell you, hey, just make this responsive. I guarantee you this will happen to you. And you're going to have to struggle as a front-end developer or maybe a designer to figure out how to take an existing design and make it responsive. Here's the challenge with that. If you take the example we were looking at earlier, the Boston Globe. Here's the big version of the Boston Globe, okay? Three columns. Here's the tablet version, I'm reminding you, and here's the phone version. Now, if the vice president comes to you and says, just do it, just, I don't care, just do it, and got to get it done by Tuesday, you got to somehow figure out how to take something like this three-column version and convert it into a one-column version. And so you might say, oh yeah, okay, that's pretty simple. I can do that. I can just drop a column and knock these two other things underneath. No problem. Aha! But what about the banner? The banner's big here. It's small here. The nav bar's long here and has eight items. It's short here and has three items. Even the weather is different. The way they've handled the weather here, the weather here. Some of these links have disappeared. Which order do these columns go in? How does the typography change? All these things have to be thought through. You can't just apply a magic number or a magic framework or a magic anything and just make a design responsive. Responsive design, unfortunately, folks, requires design. And so uh, for the vice presidents out there who are listening to this, sorry, man, uh, woman, it's got to, <laughs> it's got to, it takes work. You got to think about logo. You got to think about nav. You got to think about content images. And you know, I haven't even covered this, but you got to think about load time. Um, and that's where you start to get into some fancy JavaScript and some server side stuff and try to make um, the mobile experience load quickly, but the desktop experience uh, also load quickly. But it can have more. Um, it can have more content, more images, bigger images. You get into Retina displays and all the other stuff we've been talking about. Things can get complex. Now, you can do it. And you can do it almost entirely with HTML and CSS and a little bit of JavaScript. Um, sometimes you need server-side stuff and sometimes you don't, but it takes work. So how can you get this stuff done? I'm going to walk you through a couple of strategies if you're responsible for putting together a responsive design. One possible strategy, and this is a totally legit strategy, is to use a framework. 
other folks have come up with CSS frameworks that incorporate responsive design. Here's one of them. It's called Bootstrap. It's made by the good folks who uh, make Twitter. Uh, it's free and available. I've included a link to this and to several other examples uh, in the Summer of Learning forum uh, with your homework assignment. Uh, what this, uh, this is a screenshot from their documentation. What they're saying is they've set up a column grid system. You can set up um, these columns or any combination of these columns on your website and then when you make things smaller or bigger the columns change in a uh, predictable way. Uh, you can actually go to this website and uh, move your wind browser window around and you can see how things move back and forth. Totally legit, makes no sense at all if you've already got an established website that doesn't use a framework like this, but if you don't, you're starting from scratch, this could actually save you a good bit of time. And I recommend you check out Bootstrap or there are a million variations, all of which are probably equally excellent. Um, and um, a little bit of Googling will get you started there. Okay, so what about if you're doing it from scratch? You're building your own. Well, another strategy for that is to plan for the devices that your users will be using. Let's walk through it. So you want to start with, let's start with a phone, okay? Uh, lots of different phone sizes out there, but generally speaking, many phones are about 240 pixels by 320 pixels. That's a fairly standard phone size. Um, uh, so, boom, you got phones taken care of. Oh, whoa, 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 no, you don't. You got to take care of the phones horizontal. You flip it on its side. Well, that's 320 by 240. You got to flip the dimensions. So, you got to take care of those two widths, the 240 width and the 320 width. Done. Let's go to tablets. Let's take a standard tablet. Now, lots of tablets are different, but a standard size is 768 by 1024. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. What about on its side? And you got to do 1024 by 768. All right, so you got four widths here. Now we got to get desktops. If we're, being, if we're being fancy about this, we might as well take care of laptops or smaller screens. An example size would be 1280 by 800, though all laptops obviously are different. And then maybe you could take care of the big ginormous screens that, might, that desktops have. An example size on a smaller end might be 1920 by 1080. Okay, these are six very, very reasonable sizes that would probably cover a, a fairly large part, a portion of your audience. You've got six different widths here. Now, if you've got six widths, that means because response, remember I said responsive design requires design, and not just because I said it, but because it's actually true, it means you got to have six designs. You have to at least have thought through all the things that those particular browser widths need. It means you got to mock those up better mock those up or you better at least plan for them and not every website is one page or one page design a pretty like a robust website uh, might have 10 templates in it and you add all these together and you've got a heck of a lot of work especially when you start talking about the revisions that are required in any sort of normal website design process it's miserable Take on, uh, on top of that that not all sizes are the same. An iPad is 768 by 1024. That's the, the, the sample size that I gave earlier. But an HTC Flyer, another popular tablet, is different. It's 600 by 1024. And these guys didn't get together and decide what their resolutions were. They just they built their own. You take another one, a Kindle Fire. That's 600 wide, like the Flyer, but uh, uh, the Kindle Fire is like the Flyer. Huh? But uh, it's much shorter. It's 819 tall. So if you're trying to make customized designs that look perfect on all these screens, you've got tons and tons of devices that you got to think about and design for and test. And you've got to think about what's coming next. What about when uh, you can access the web on the side of your camcorder? Or what about when you can access it on the back of your camera? Or in your fridge? Or in your car? Or on a wristwatch? How the heck are you going to make uh, all those designs perfect for each of those screens? Very, very challenging. Very challenging. A third strategy that I might recommend to you is to go with just three sizes. Small, medium, and large. But these sizes are based on the content of your website, not on a device. This is strange. Let me explain this a little bit. I'm talking about small, medium, and large, which you might think of if you're doing a design or responsive design as small be for the phone, medium's for the tablet, and large for the desktop. And you know, honestly, it's probably right. I'm not, I'm not saying you're wrong if you think that way. That's probably exactly how it would be used. But it's not the right way to think about it if you do this particular strategy that I'm espousing. The right way to think about it is not this, but it's instead think of it in terms of content. For an example, 
The small might be one column, the medium might be two columns, and the large might be three columns. Now, how many columns they actually are, it depends on your content, your typography, your line lengths, uh, the kind of photography you have, the imagery that you have. Uh, it's, it's entirely up to your design, but build the three designs based on your content and comp them up from the start. Don't wait till the end or you will get burned. Even more than comping them up from the start, a useful strategy that some folks have found who have gone through this a lot is to not start with the big version. You would think that if you're comping something like this up, you'd start with the big one and then you'd make the medium by cutting things away and then you'd make the small one by cutting more things away. Well, a lot of folks say turn that on, your he on its head and do the mobile version first. Not only in design, but specifically, more specifically actually, in code. Mobile first, which is a buzzword that you'll also sometimes hear around the web, means coding the smallest layout first in CSS. Here's what I mean. I'm talking about coding the small layout in CSS first, which means not this way. This is the standard way. The standard way is to lay out the big site in CSS and then use media queries for smaller devices. So you might use an at media query to, to target for if you've got a small device, then you change something in some way. That Usain Bolt version uh, page that I showed you a few minutes ago, it did it this way. It did it in exactly this way. It was the big site first, and then we used media queries to make them morph into one column instead of two. Now, there's a technical bad reason. Uh, there's a technical reason for not doing this, a reason um, why this is a bad idea. And the technical reason is that every device, no matter what, gets the code for the big site, the CSS for the big site. Um, which means that if you've got background images or you've got other assets that need to be loaded in, mobile phones, which are on those 3G networks or 4G networks or networks that are relatively slow, they get desktop-sized assets, which makes the page slow to load. Instead, you flip this idea of uh, building CSS upside down. Uh, you lay out the mobile site first, and then you use media queries for bigger devices. So the mobile site is what everybody gets first. Media queries are uh, what are shown for mo bigger devices. But everybody, it's not like you see the mobile site and then it transforms into the big site. No, no, no. If you're on a, if you're on a desktop, you're just going to see the right thing. All this happens behind the scenes. Um, it's not like it's building it for you and you're watching it building in action. Um, so the experience is going to be right. But if you do it this way, it means mobile phones skip the desktop assets assets and so it's faster to load over slow networks hope that makes sense okay a couple more thoughts and then we're done we're ready for questions and answers first thought is uh, earlier today I showed you uh, the Washington Post and it has a mobile website and the Boston Globe has responsive design what's the difference why should you do one or the other all right well, let's look at the Washington Post the Washington Post's desktop site looks like this its mobile site looks like this. This is www.washingtonpost.com. This is mobile.washingtonpost.com. You can go to mobile.washingtonpost.com right now on your desktop and you'll see something exactly like this. Something very different than the desktop version. Here's the responsive design version. This is the Boston Globe. Remember this is the desktop version. This is the phone version. Both of them are www.bostonglobe.com. If you go to www.bostonglobe.com, you're going to see this if you're on a desktop, and you'll see this on your desktop if you're on a phone. If you shrink the browser window on your desktop, it'll start to morph around for you, and you'll be able to see different things. But it's the same web address. Also, uh, it's the same HTML. I'll get to that in a second. So whether you do mobile site, a, a separate mobile site, or you do a responsive design, both require thought and effort. There are definite pros and cons to both. I'm not espousing responsive design as the cure-all and the way that everybody should do it because there are pros and cons. But the biggest difference between them is that responsive design gives you the same HTML for your desktop version, your tablet version, and your phone version. And the mobile-only site gives you different HTML for those versions. The Boston Globe version here, the desktop and the phone they're the exact same markup, the exact same HTML. It's just the CSS has changed the layout. The Washington Post version has different HTML. So if you need to display completely different content 
and need different HTML on your mobile version of your website, then you should probably do a mobile version and not responsive design. Though you can hide things and you can show things and there's certainly trickery you can do and maybe that's the right way to do it. It depends on your particular circumstance. But if it's the same markup and you're okay with the same markup on both devices, then the responsive design version potentially offers a lot less server work and server upkeep uh, maintenance by you. Now, you might wonder, how do they get, how do they make this nav thing work? Because this looks different. This looks like different HTML. This has news, metro, arts, business, sports, etc. And this only has one section. They did not, they don't use different HTML. They use CSS. They've hidden these guys using display none. And they've hidden them behind the sections thing. So that when you click sections or tap sections with your finger, it pops up and you can choose your different sections. But all that is done entirely in CSS and not using magical CSS properties. It's just things like display and float and absolute and relative positioning. So there's nothing magical going on here. It's just that that CSS puts it inside here. And so it's like a drop down menu. Whereas here, it's not like a drop down menu. And that's all just done in CSS. It's the exact same HTML. That's it for today. Let me bring you to our homework. Homework assignment is uh, the code and assets for this are included in the Summer of Learning form board where you can log in, download all this stuff. I've got screenshots, I've got instructions, and I have a solution posted there um, that I don't want you to peek at, but when you're ready and you're finished, you can see how it is that, um, the, 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 that you can solve this task if you get stumped. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to take this page right here, which I've provided a base version of for you, and you're going to make it responsive. This is a static layout right now. You're going to make it responsive. You're going to create three different versions. One version is going to be the small version, which has a big image and one column of content. Then you're going to create a medium version, which I have decided is going to be a small image right here with the content flowing around it. Still only one column, but a smaller image. And then you're going to create a large version, which has the column of content here and the sidebar adjacent to it instead of below it. Those are the three versions that you're going to create. When you're done, post your work in the forum at thesummeroflearning.com. You can see other people's work, you can comment on other people's work, and if you have questions, we'll be happy to try to answer them. So the question is, if you're deciding whether to use a mobile site to, to create a mobile version of your website or a responsive design website, what factors do you use? Well, okay, a couple of different factors. Um, the 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 easiest and simplest litmus test for me is does the mobile version have the same content as the desktop version it's just in a different order in a different presentation or maybe some stuff is hidden or is the mobile content really 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 different like you really need to show different articles or different language or you need to have different HTML for the mobile version than you do for the desktop version if, you, if the HTML needs to be different, if the content needs to be different, then you're probably in better shape doing some server-side sniffing and sending mobile ver users over to a mobile website. If not, your simpler choice is to use responsive design. Here's why your simpler choice is to use responsive design. If you do mobile sniffing on the back end and say, and you, you have a server that's set up that's saying, uh, for every request that comes in, it says, hey, is this particular request coming from a desktop, a laptop, a, a tablet, or a phone? And then it redirects it to a different website based on that. That's, relatively speaking, a lot of work for the server to do. But even that's not a big deal. The big deal is that if you set up all the definitions for what is a mobile phone, and it's completely accurate today. So you've got all the iPhones, you got all the Androids, you got all the Nokia's, you got everything internationally using all kinds of phones that are not common at all in the United States. You've got every kind of tablet, you've got every kind of um, uh, other small device, you got Kindles, you got everything. You gotta keep that list up to date on the server. So the server knows what's a mobile device and what isn't a mobile device. Because there's no way for the server to know that unless you say, hey, the word iPhone means mobile device. Or really, it's mobile WebKit. And the version of mobile WebKit and what you're, you know, whether it's an iPad or an iPhone. That is a tremendous amount of upkeep. Now, you can pay some companies that will do that for you. But it's more complicated. What responsive design says is, I don't care what device you're on. I care about the width of your screen. And if the width of the screen is a certain thing, 
then reformat the CSS or apply CSS in a different way. And that'll work on a phone, a tablet, it'll work on a uh, when my Prius can access the web uh, and when my fridge can get to Twitter. Are there any other questions? Okay, great question. The question is, if you're going to set up at media queries with breakpoints to have different widths for your design, how many, like what width should you use and how many of those different breakpoints should you set? Um, and again, you can approach it a couple of different ways. The standard way is to say, okay, the iPhone, the iPad are popular. Let's set those widths and design for those. And maybe we'll design for the iPhone that's vertical rather than horizontal. Or maybe you decide that the Android's a better way to go than the iPhone. And you just pick a width, 320 pixels, and you say, boom, that's my width and that's what I'm designing for. Okay, that works. Second way is this Goldilocks method um, that other people have espoused and, 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 uh, and, f and recommend, and which I think is the right way to go too, and that's the small, medium, and large way. Okay, so what's, I told you small, medium, and large, great, that's three, fantastic, thanks Jim. Uh, what, what widths do I use? What's small, what's medium, what's large? Get me pixel widths. Well, the thing is, I think the best way to do it is to make the pixel widths dependent on how line lengths lay out using your particular typeface at your particular with your particular content so design it to line lengths if you have let me go back here I what what width this is I haven't specified well actually I did specify it for you in the homework assignment because I wanted to give you a break but if you're doing this on your own you would make it such that the line length here is a comfortable read which is about 66 characters per line. So once you've established what typography you want here, right now I'm using uh, Helvetica at a particular size or Arial at a particular size, um, and I would say, all right, 66 characters is about this many pixels wide on the various devices I'm looking at, and it starts to get uncomfortable at, say, 400 pixels. So at 400, I'm going to change it to this, or maybe at this point, the image can go next to it so it's comfortable. And then at some point, uh, the column gets too wide, so I'm going to drop the second column in here because there's enough room for it. So as many sizes as work for your content and your design, uh, and the widths of those sizes should based, be based on your content and your design. I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, I hope you'll follow up. The third question, the last question for us, is about navigation and responsive design. What's the right way to handle navigation responsively? Uh, oh, excuse me, folks. I didn't mean to, uh, to do that. Let me get back to this slide. The, the right way to handle navigation responsively is going to be dependent on your content and your navigation and how it works. That's not a cop-out answer. It's actually true. If you have 10 nav items that you're trying to get to and they're all equally important, that's going to be real hard to put that at the top of a mobile phone. If you've got two that are really important, that's going to be really easy to put at the top of a mobile phone. Okay, that being said, let's look at the Boston Globe and see how they've done it and see if see the ways in which that's instructive. Sorry, I flipped to those slides real quick. I hope I didn't give you all a seizure. Um, the, the, how they've handled navigation is they've said, okay, on a big screen, you can put these major section headings all the way across. On a small screen, you can't. You can't do it. It's not going to fit. You could stack them on top of each other, but then you'd push the content way below the fold. That's no good. So how are we going to handle that? And they decided that these three were the most important to them. They rolled up all this stuff, news, metro, arts, business, etc., under sections. They left my saved. Probably somebody there was very interested in making sure that you were able to save particular articles that you wanted to read and to see them. And they took the search bar and they moved the search bar from being a box that you type into and, an, and a magnifying glass into just the magnifying glass. Now if you tap on this, the search bar pops up. But they said, we don't have the real estate for all this stuff. So we got to shrink it down and we got to decide what of this is absolutely most important and that's what goes at the top of the device. These are hard, hard decisions to make and they can get very political within an organization very quickly. Way to cope with that? Well, it's tough, man. I'm sorry. Like, it's just tough. Um, a couple of ways to cope with it. One is start with this. Start with the small one. Do not leave it for the end or you will be hosed. Like, just... just um, uh, in terms of your process and within your your organization, but start with this kind of thing so that you know 
what is the really important stuff and what is less important. Uh, test it with folks, obviously, usability testing, even done in a, the lowest possible key way, the least expensive way can be really instructive and useful. And uh, uh, look at what other people are doing. Um, you know, so I've got the same advice for you that I would give to anybody about any navigation issue. If that didn't answer your question or if you've got more follow-up, I do hope that you'll talk with us in the forum because um, uh, we've got good folks there who are waiting to, to continue the conversation with you, both folks from Aquent Vitamin T and folks uh, just like you who want to talk to each other. I'm really excited about it.